And so next we actually have a, um, a trio of speakers who are going to be talking about the Genomics um, Virtual Lab. And they're um, a, a trio that um, have their head in the cloud a lot of the time, and that's a good thing because they're, they're all about deploying a lot of these bioinformatics um, tools in a reproducible way by uh, establishing um, virtual machines that, that can be fired up by um, novice researchers and getting rid of a lot of the, the overhead involved in doing that. Now, I was quite hoping they were going to do the, um, the talk as, as one slide each, sort of walking around in a, a little trio. But um, I think Andrew Isaacs is going to start off and he'll introduce the um, other speakers as they, they come along. And just while they're setting that up, I'll briefly revisit the, um, the storage issue. And one of the things there is that, um, of course, you notice that the, um, the rate of sequencing output has gone above Moore's law for a large amount of time. So this has been a point in time where, where the, the hardware growth hasn't actually kept up with the data production growth. Um, and a lot of my colleagues I know actually don't bother trying to store raw data anymore. They store the raw samples, which because it is cheaper and easier to do so than to um, store the data, which is uh, something that I think we need to um, think about addressing um, from a reproducibility point of view. Okay, ready? Good. Thanks, Matt. Uh, thanks, Ellen, for inviting us. Um, <clears throat> yes, yeah, so it's such a weird location, isn't it? <laughs> um, so I'm going to be talking about a cloud-based virtual laboratory, uh, in particular the genomics virtual laboratory. As you've heard, a very strong theme in bioinformatics is genomics. Um, what we try to tell people about the genomics virtual laboratory is how easy, accessible, reliable, robust, reusable, many other R words in there, I'm sure. Uh, but we're not showing you any of that today. We're going to show you the gory details, the uh, what's under the hood, the nuts and bolts. So it may look complex, but that's because we're giving you the behind the scenes look. The, the, the real take home story here is to the end user, to the scientist, to the bioinformatician, this should be easy to use. Okay, so I'm going to cover how we got to a genomics virtual laboratory, what's motivated us. Um, Dr. Simon Gladman will then talk about, no, sorry, I've given him an honorary PhD. Um, <laughs> we'll talk about Ansible. Uh, which is how we maintain the current image and version. And Yusuf, who, oops, sorry. And Yusuf, uh, what have I done? How do I go to? All right. And Yusuf, who's going off to do a PhD, uh, will be talking about our sort of future direction to make it even easier for bioinformaticians to host their own versions of our genomics virtual laboratory. Am I on? Yep. Okay. So seven, five years ago, this was yet another image that you saw at every bioinformatics conference. I'm glad I'm, no one else has used it yet today. <laughs> but uh, this is actually a picture of Mount Fuji, believe it or not. But everyone <laughs> takes the fact that there's this giant wave. And it's, so it's always the tsunami of data that everyone talks about. Um, I think the reality is it's actually more about the people in the boat that we're concentrating on. Um, so the reality is that I think scientists don't just randomly go collect data. I know we're talking about storage and data and everything like that, and yes, it is cheap to collect, but experiments still cost a lot of money to run, basically, and set up, and you really want the result. So the truth of the matter is that there's more, a lot, a lot of work. Oh, sorry, by the way, this is a pipeline picture. This is just a one from many. Again, another cliche of bioinformatics talks is pipelines. Um, so what we really want is to get to the end of that diagram. That's where we actually want to start doing the work, doing the science, doing the bioinformatics. But to do that, we have to make sure each one of those bits of software is installed, is that the version we need, is up to date, works with everything else. And I'm sure many in this room who have done this kind of thing, administering the software, making sure it works, um, the versions are correct, the environment variable is set up properly, is just a nightmare. And so we have 
the problem we have and why the cloud is quite good for, in some sense is because we have data. We have either the data we've collected, we have repositories of um, standard data that's been collected and curated, you, you know, lots of data sources, the data we want to collect that's at 90% capacity. Uh, we have lots of tools. There, some are good tools, some are terrible tools, but we still have lots of tools. And then we have lots of ways of processing those tools. Uh, sorry, the, and the data. So, this is my favorite picture. What we, <laughs> hopefully this has never been seen in any bioinformatics talk, but. Uh, so what, this is absolutely what we want to avoid, being the poor monkey that has to maintain <laughs> some system. Uh, <clears throat> uh, Bernie wanted me to say this was the VLACI machine room, but I can assure you it isn't. Um, so yes, what we want to do is avoid all the monkey business that goes into maintaining the tools and actually get to the science. So one solution is to build a bigger tool <laughs> that collects all the other tools, but now we've just got one extra tool. It's a bit like standards. You build a new standard and now you've got an extra standard. Uh, so a better solution that we're, is our claim is just to put collections of tools. And now I'm talking, well, given it's cloud-based, you can have a virtual image with a data set pre-canned or the tools you want pre-canned. Our architecture, I would argue, is even a little bit more clever than that. We'll get to that. Um, so yes, we can select our tools. You can have, you can, version control is something that I haven't really heard much about today, but is something that is a great problem to most of you. Uh, so you can have any particular rack you like that you pull out and use when you need it. If you, you can have the latest versions if you like, but if you have to reproduce that clinical data that you had five years ago, you go pull out that one and hopefully you can reproduce it. Okay, so our choices. Um, again, being cloud-based gives you the luxury of we can ourselves host a genomics virtual laboratory. So that means whoever comes onto that, logs onto that, gets an account, gets the gorilla. You, it's big, it's powerful, it can do the work, but you have to come to us and we'll do it for you. Not that we're gorillas. Uh, the alternative is that you can host your own. I know I'm really stretching the metaphor here, but I like the monkeys, okay? So the alternative is you can host your own cloud and have lots and lots of groups hosting their own clouds versions of the genomics virtual laboratory and they can custom it and tailor it. And so what today's speakers are going to tell you about is some of the background tools that have been built to allow people who host their own images of the genomics virtual laboratory to host it in a very simple way. So with that, I will hand over to, oh, no, sorry, I've got more. I forgot. <laughs> so uh, yes, just to give you some context of to what it actually looks like. So a user has, uh, there's actually three things overlapping here. So you can have nice web uh, browser-based um, workflow engines. So they're graphical. You can slide things around and connect one tool to the next tool. Uh, that's called Galaxy. You, you locate the data. Uh, you can have RStudio, for example. Uh, we've heard a few other tools mentioned today that could equally well be uh, bundled up into the genomics virtual laboratory, uh, our lovely graphical interfaces that we saw earlier sessions. And if you're really old school like me, you still can have a good old SSH shell into the system. Uh, the tools we'll be talking about today that uh, allow people to host their own and administer the hosting is uh, the GVL launcher, which unsurprisingly launches the genomics virtual laboratory. But it does more, there's more going on there. It's connecting the data or several different sources of data, this, where you store the data, where you, you get your um, libraries from, to the cloud. There's, uh, once your system is up and running, you can actually run different services. services on your cloud that people can use. And even nicer, you can actually uh, run a cluster from your genomics virtual laboratory and you have control over how many cores are running, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so now, I think, <laughs> last bit. So yes, this is what we'll get into the nuts and bolts today. So normally, even someone hosting a genomics virtual laboratory on their own cluster doesn't even really have to worry about the this side of things. but. The GVL, in a sense, is the collection, the ecosystem, uh, the framework. So you can have 
not any particular type of cloud. Cloud, but we're working on Cloud Bridge, which is a uh, new technology that will be talked about later uh, to talk to different types of clouds. So cloud agnostic is a word that gets bandied around. Um, again, we have the launcher that lets you cho choose a set of tools. So you can slide out each particular set of tool use you need. Uh, you choose your data sets and genome space allows you to connect your data from one location because it's hard to move data around, especially terabytes of data. So you tend to want to have it in its place and then take the, it, the compute to where the data is. So genome space allows you to do that. Now I'm going to hand over to Simon. <laughs> And because um, Andrew killed my speaker notes, I have to restart the presentation. <laughs> ah. Hello. There we go. Okay, so Andrew talked about lots of other people want to use our, I'll smooth this down a bit. Andrew talked about the fact that a lot of people want to use the GVL and we want people to use the GVL and we want it to be able to use it wherever they want. So one thing it needs to be is easily launchable. Now if I'm going to use the GVL to do a bunch of bioinformatics analysis and somebody else is going to use the GVL for the bioinformatics analysis, we want them to have the same set of tools and the same set of data to be able to do reproducible work. And so the Genomics Virtual Lab needs to be reproducible. However, bioinformatics software changes very quickly, and it's a, it's a, we're, a lot of us tend to work at the bleeding edge of bioinformatics, and we always seem to be updating versions of little bits of software, and, and then you know one particular tool will have an, um, an almighty upgrade, which will break a whole bunch of other tools, which then need to be re-updated, and et cetera, et cetera. And so this happens in bioinformatics quite a lot. So, um, and the, one of the other things that we have is that uh, different areas of bioinformatics all need different sets of tools. So um, people working in the area of proteomics, for example, so people who work with protein data, they need a completely different set of tools to what someone who's working in genomics, especially in, say, microbial genomics or cancer genomics or clinical genomics. And we also need different reference data. So therefore, we decided that what we should do is, um, one, release the genomics virtual laboratory regularly and have it tightly versioned and all of the tools and reference data that are bundled up with it also to be tightly versioned. And this is the important part, to make it flexible, to separate everything out. So we could have um, the operating system image and then have the tool sets as another object and then the reference data as another object. And then that would all help the flexibility of it. And then we can, all of these things can be built semi-independently from one another. And so we can just, grab one image, one set of tools and one reference data, build it together and make a GVL flavor for you. Okay, to launch the GVL, we have a web page that runs Django in the back end, but it's basically, uh, it talks directly to whatever cloud you want you know, using an API. And this particular web page is pretty simple to operate. Um, you can choose which cloud you want your machine to run on, give it some um, credentials so you can get access to the cloud, and then choose a machine size, and then a bunch of, you can choose the image, the tools, and the reference data, and then you click the little create a cluster button down the bottom, and then it, the launch page will then talk to the cloud you asked for the machine on, get it to um, start up a machine, and then what it does is it passes a YAML file to that particular machine on the cloud, which tells that machine all the different things that we want to have on it. So it'll tell us, it'll say, this particular one says, I want the microbial genomics version of the tool set, and I want the tutorial version of the indices or the reference data to please be put on this. And once you've done, I also want the extra special genomics virtual laboratory command line utilities to be installed. And so that all happens just in a YAML file, which is really easy to read. And that happens in the back end of the launch page. 
So you go away and you do all this and then suddenly you've got a JBL in the cloud which has all these different um, applications all running, all ready to go for, for users. So it has Galaxy which is um, a graphical based interface for doing bioinformatics. Um, it has a VNC within your web browser to get to a, a Linux desktop. You can um, SSH into it like any other normal remote machine. It has Jupyter Hub for doing um, uh, interactive um, Python and in R Studio for doing graphical R and a whole bunch of other things. But the launcher and Cloud Man together, the Cloud Manager, hook all these things together and just present the user with a, a machine that's in the, in the cloud, whichever cloud they choose, that's tailored for them. All right, so building this was a bit of a challenge. One of the problems that we had was that um, the Nectar Cloud, the root partition is limited to 10 gigabytes. And so we couldn't put everything in one partition. It turns out that this works out really good because it forces us to separate the tools and the reference data from the base image. And the transient disk that each cloud machine gets is also tied to the number of cores you ask for for that particular machine. So a two core node will only get 60 gigabytes of disk and a 16 core node will get 450, let's say. However, all of these things force us to build the image, the tool set, which we call a file system, and a reference data object separately. We tried a bunch of different methods. We started out with Cloud by Linux, which was a, um, a pre-built Ubuntu image that came bundled with a whole bunch of bioinformatics software. And then we ran some fabric scripts on it. But we'll talk, I'll explain that now. So the first thing we needed to do was build the machine image. So we took Cloud by Linux and we ran this fabric script on it and we got the GBL base image, which includes some extra system packages in R. And then we used that image to build a file system snapshot which was more fabric scripts, and then a whole bunch of manual tweaks where, oh, this thing didn't work, so we better go in and update the version of this package and download, oh, hang on, we've got to get the matching one for this package, et cetera, et cetera. And it was all painful. And then we had to build all the reference data from hand, so we, by hand, so we had to download all the FASTA files, index them for all the different tools, because these are big, and so they need really good in indices to be able to run these tools properly. And it was really difficult to understand. The flow of execution was not clear. Um, because it wasn't automated, um, it led to inconsistencies between builds and things would break every time we tried to rebuild it. And so we just basically avoided doing any rebuilds, which kind of made it all useless in about six months' time because everything was old. So then we took a look at this thing called Ansible, which is an automation tool for configuring and managing computers. It was released in February 2012, and it allows you to do multi-node software deployment, ad hoc task execution, and configuration management. So in other words, if you take a, a vanilla Ubuntu machine, you run an Ansible script on it, and then suddenly it's installed Apache and configured it and restarted all the services, et cetera, and got it all up and running and configured it for you. All right. But why do we want to use it? Well, we wanted to use it so we could avoid forgetting all the stuff that we did manually. And uh, we'd also codify the knowledge about systems. So by writing an Ansible script, you've really got to think about what's going on on your, on your system. And it also makes it replicable. So I can run it, I can run it tomorrow, and one of my colleagues can, runs it, can run it the day after, and we're going to produce the same thing again and again. And this makes the infrastructure programmable. So we can write a script to build a computer for us. It's pretty cool. All right, so the structure of an Ansible playbook, um, it's pretty simple. It's written in YAML files, and it can be structured as, um, it's just in a simple file to hierarchy. You have global variables. The inventory contains a list of the IP addresses of the machines that you want to work on. And then here you have a bunch of tasks, and they're in YAML format. Features are, it's really easy to learn, it's YAML, it's uh, Ginger 2 if you want to do um, templates and any files for the, the list of machines you want to work on. It, um, it can execute um, on parallel machines it can concurrently, but it's sequential, it goes through the, uh, the script sequentially. Um, it just uses SSH connections, so it's fairly minimal requirements. It's um, a pip install Ansible is how you install it. Uh, no need for a centralized management server, which you know, a lot of these deployment software type things need a central management server, which everything is recognized. This you don't. You just do pip install Ansible, run my playbook. 
Um, it's idempotent, which means that um, executing at n times is no different to executing at once. So um, sometimes with these things, if you run the same script on the machine again, you'll end up breaking something you've done earlier. All these ones don't. It says, oh, no, you've already done that. Don't need to do it again. I'll only fix up the bit, the new bit that I've added. And it's extensible because you can write your own modules for it. Okay, so playbook is just a YAML file which looks like this. And this, this is the playbook that would install Apache, um, configure it for you, restart it, and um, get, it, get it running as a service. And it's pretty simple. <laughs> Basically, this, is, this line here says yum. So it's going to use the yum package management system. It says, oh yeah, install HTTPD. I think the battery just went flat. I oh, know. Said, so, yeah, so it's going to install HTTPD. Um, and we want the latest version. That's pretty much it. OK, so that how this applies to the GVL is that now we can take a vanilla Ubuntu without Cloud by Linux, because Cloud by Linux had lots of old software packages and wasn't being updated regularly. So now we can take um, a plain old Ubuntu image, run the GVL image on it, take the same machine, run the GVL file system on it, and snapshot, snapshot the file system. And then we've also built an Ansible script to get all the reference data and run all the indices for it. But it's a bit smarter than that. It actually thinks about all the tools that we've installed as part of the tool set, tool set and then runs all the appropriate ind indexing for us. So the cool part about it is it's decomposed into smaller roles because we can reuse them. So um, for example, uh, Galaxy Project uses Ansible to build their things, and so we can just use their scripts as dependencies of ours. Um, it's a linear flow of execution. It's really easy to understand. Simple YAML-based de declarative syntax, and it's fully automated. So in other words, if I run it, it'll be the same as when Yusuf runs it. Some other advantages, the scripts themselves are version controlled in a GitHub repository, which is really good. So if I want to build last year's GVL, I just bring up that particular um, change set and rerun it, and I'll build last year's GVL. Um, the roles are dependencies, so we've got good code reuse. Um, but this is a really cool part, is that GVL flavors, so GVLs targeted for different areas of bioinformatics are really easy to produce because all I need to do is um, extend one of the roles and override some of the global variables. And then suddenly I've got a, a, a standard GVL, but it's been altered slightly to tailor, home in on a certain area of bioinformatics. For example, the microbial, um, say, public health area or clinical genomics or cancer genomics. So um, that's how we go about building the GVL. Um, now Yusuf is going to talk about, I think, that's Yusuf. Yep, Yusuf's going to talk about um, what happens when we want to run it on lots of different clouds that are different. Okay, we hear a lot about cloud. How many of you believe that cloud is a good thing? Good. <laughs> and I'm sure lots of us are using cloud uh, in some sense. You're using Gmail, it's on cloud. You're using Yahoo. And if you are using GVL, it's on cloud. Uh, you can have your personal GVL uh, by a few clicks and run all the things that Simon showed you to have your workbench, which is your tool to go in to do your pipeline processing and bring in your data and get your result. But at the back end, it's not that happy face. <laughs> it's good, it's flexible, scalable, and accessible. You can access it through an IP and just go there. But the bad thing is, we used to say cloud is something, a black box there that no one touches. You just put your things there. Not anymore. You have lots of providers. You have Google, you have Amazon. Now we have Nectar, which is an open stack. And it's really hard to put things 
together for each of these things. So we had to solve this problem. We have to come up with a solution to say, OK, here is my GVL. Let's run it on OpenStack. Or here is my GVL. Let's run it on Amazon. And fortunately, there is there was a PhD student in, in Swiss, I believe, that introduced RESTful APIs and REST requests. How many of you are familiar with REST requests? And for those who don't know what REST is, it's just a way of sending a request to a service on the cloud. Uh, it's a stateless and it's awesome. <laughs> So we ended up defining this cloud unification, uh, which means we unify all our requests uh, to a single point of view and deliver a robust platform for each uh, cloud, provi cloud provider. Uh, what that means is now we can leverage uh, resources on different cloud pr uh, providers. Uh, and everything is automated, as you saw through the Ansible, which Simon showed you. But from a user perspective, that means you don't need to go to Amazon Cloud or Nectar Cloud or GC Google Cloud to say, I want to do this. You go to an IP and do your job. So you don't, you just provide your, uh, credentials, which I will show you how easy it is, and just go to an IP and do what you want. Uh, why we ended up using RESTful APIs? Because REST helps us to uh, get rid of saying which library, which tool, which application we should use. Two, which request we should send. So we could, we could end up having a service on the cloud and say, OK, this is my request to this service, and this service will return me this result, no matter what I'm using. So you can even use your uh, Google, ex Google Chrome extension or Firefox extension to send that request. Um, what exact problems we were solving? We were solving two main things. First, uh, archiving. Um, if you are a researcher and you don't archive your data, it's basically useless, at least to me. So if you're not uh, caring about your data and archiving it, why others should care about that data? And we also should care about the compute nodes. And with the REST API, we come to one solution. Uh, for the storage, Cloud provides an object store, uh, which is reusable, redundant, replicated, and it's access on demand. And basically, someone, that cloud provider, is uh, maintaining it for you. So it's very cheap, um, rather than just storing your data somewhere on the cloud next to your compute node. For this object storage, uh, through a collaboration with Broad Institute, we come up with genome space. It was initiated first in Broad Institute and basically solved the API mania on a storage system. What it provides is uh, a beautiful uh, platform for seeing your file system, seeing your object storage on the cloud which I will show you next how it looks like exactly on the cloud, and put the, uh, that archive next to your compute node, which is, in our case, we can just uh, connect it to a galaxy like here. I was gonna give a demo, but yeah, it's not. I need 30 minutes at least. Uh, and if you have ever used Nectar, the object storage on Nectar looks like this, which is basically you can't do many things there. It's like, yeah, it's a flat file system. Everything is 
uh, with the name and uh, you have to main, you have to do whatever you can with uh, the library that they have given you. Rather than with genome space, you can just see a file, a family of file system that you can do most of the basic file manipulation like changing some file name, uploading, downloading, deleting, moving files just by drag and drop things. And as you can see here, genome space can uh, talk to various clouds. Uh, at the moment, it's supporting Amazon, uh, Dropbox, and Swift. Uh, and Google is coming. Google uh, Drive is coming. And we can just send our archive data to our compute node through just a single button by sending to Galaxy. Now, for a storage, we came up with a web interface that unifies everything. How about bringing the same thing for compute nodes? If I want to run some image on Amazon, I should be able to do it just by single click and don't care about what API Amazon is providing. Uh, it's basically the same process. So why I can't do the same thing? The idea was old. Back in days, uh, OpenStack said we are going to support EC2. But uh, Amazon was so fast, and they said, OK, this, the, the piece of Amazon is not our piece. So let's drop that and have our own API, which caused lots of problems. So they came up with their own API and their own way of uh, uh, the, uh, accessing their resource. So we ended up designing a, a library to unify these resources. Uh, on Amazon, Botu is the a standard way of talking to Amazon through Python. Uh, on Nectar, there is Nova Client, uh, which is a, another Python library to talk to. And Google has their own API. So we said, OK, let's wrap something around all these APIs, provide a RESTful uh, interface to it, and create a new library, which is basically a wrapper around all of those, with an idea of having an optimum solution. Not a minimum solution, because uh, what, I, what do I mean by optimum? Uh, we ended up uh, saying, OK, Amazon is providing these services. Google is providing these services. Nectar is providing these services. Let's bring these services together and select the important part. Uh, for example, an image on running an image on Nectar will go into at least 10 uh, states, rather than on Amazon, it only goes to four. So we ended up saying defining a few states, which was five, I think, which was one more than Amazon, to say, OK, your cloud in running a cloud instance should go through these five states. Uh, Amazon is not providing one of them because of they want to provide 100% satisfaction to their users, which is not the case on many other cloud providers like Nectar. <laughs> and we define Cloud Bridge. It's a library, it's a Python library. Uh, and as I said, with the design goal of having an optimum solution for uh, these, and it's an open source, you can go to GitHub, get the code. There is a uh, read the docs uh, blog for uh, uh, web page for documenting the cloud breach. And testing philosophy is, okay, we need to have a set of tests that runs on each cloud and satisfy our cases for different uh, cloud provider. So we run single uh, test scenario and run it on all of the cloud, to, all of the cloud providers to make sure that this is working. And of course, contributing is free if you like. Uh, here is the read the docs. You can see, you can, it, it has a session for getting it started, tells you how to uh, install uh, this library. Uh, 
the code is fairly simple if you can see it. Just import the library and say cloud factory that create my instance without knowing, uh, without actually say, seeing what's going on at the background through the cloud. And you can contribute through the same uh, website. And what, is, what was the use case to us? The cloud, we use CloudBridge to create our launcher. Simon was talking about you can click, you can do one click and run your virtual machine on the cloud. Uh, we use CloudBridge to be able to launch that instance on different cloud providers. Um, although uh, cloud agnostic is not that easy, but that, that was one of the steps that we had to do. The cloud launcher is also an uh, uh, open source application. You can get it from GitHub and follow, there is a tutorial to show you how to install it and what are the dependencies. It's based on Django and it gives you an IP that you can go into. That you can go into and, uh, what is happening? Uh, um, do your task. Again, I, I was going to give a demo, but. Uh, what you will see in Cloud Launch is you, first you have an admin that defines a user, define resources on the cloud, and do uh, all the required scenarios that the user needs to do to access a cloud. Uh, as you can see, you, you, well, it's, it, might be, it might not be very clear here, but you can define multiple cloud providers like Amazon and OpenStack and you know, things like that. Um, for example, here is a scene for defining a, an OpenStack uh, just by providing the URL for that uh, cloud provider. You define a, you, the users of that system by, giving, by providing a profile for them. Adding a user, for example, I have added myself here. Uh, and then we can connect that user to the cloud that we need, that that user needs to use. For example, I have connected myself to OpenStack Nectar Cloud by providing the credentials for myself. So this, this part is all what admin is doing. And from the user's perspective, it just goes to a rest, a page, log in, and then see the instances through the, their URL. But, and by clicking one URL, you can see, like for example, the list of instances or launching a new instance. So we ended up providing a restful, fully restful API for multiple cloud platforms to launch GVL on. And here, I would like to thank the organizers, Alan and Matt, specific GVL team, which has been uh, four years, I think, uh, of lots of hard work to put things together, especially any clear new one. Andrew, Derek, Igor, Ron, Mike, which have, been, which have left the uh, team, and us, three of us. Uh, VLSCI as the, the main provide the Galaxy project and uh, our founders, like RDS, Nectar, and Embel Australia. Thank you very much. So thank you, Yusuf, Simon, and Andrew. Um, now, any questions? OK, why don't we start at the left? Right, I have many questions, but I'll <laughs> hunt you down later after the <laughs> the, the break. Um, 
The main one that I wanted to ask you though is, are you thinking about using containers rather than virtual images? Uh, yes, sir. Yes. This is one of the things we decided to do for future work. Okay, I can yell. <laughs> so one of the things we decided to do for future work was uh, look at the use of Docker containers. I don't want to hope everyone kind of likes Docker, but um, so we're looking at using Docker containers to make things a bit more flexible and uh, and easy to swap tool sets in and out. So yeah, we are looking at using that kind of thing. Great talk, guys. Thanks. Uh, my question is, I guess you must be using the patient data or some privacy data. How are you handling that? Are you stripping the information before you're throwing it on the cloud, or what are you doing? Um, but I had a talk with somebody about that just before. But uh, basically, uh, clinical data is comes with a whole set of rules. And um, maybe the cloud isn't the place to be processing clinical data. And if it is, then um, you really need to have really tight control and security on the image. Uh, it's not it's not trivial, and uh, yeah, we haven't actually got up to that part yet. So, sorry, just to follow on. So, I, I guess the thing is, this is a general framework. So, yes, we personally don't worry about that. If you, as a someone who wants to host an image, you certainly could do so. But. So, because looking at your whole talk was the GBL, and I come from imaging field. I was thinking of creating a virtual lab rather than having a VCR because there is a lot of patient data. And when you talk about the patient privacy and you're talking about this sort of infrastructure to the doctors, you will see the eyes rolling all the time. Yeah. So you can't talk to neurologists or the doctors with this sort of a framework, but to be a champion or to, to take this project further, I think that's one of the key issues, I guess. Yes, sir. I'm just curious, with the um, fact you can bring up, you know, existing versions of software and stuff, has this also allowed you to, you know, you've got some paper or something published on data from a year or two ago and you can just then bring up the year or two ago stuff to reproduce results? Yeah, um, yeah so that's the plan. Uh, so, yeah. Uh, so one of the things that Cloud lets you do is snapshot the um, file system, and so that will include all the user data. And so um, we also allow it to be started up on persistent volumes. And so even if you shut down your machine, if your volume is still available, you start a new machine up and fetch the volume, and you're right to go again. Hi. Um, I noticed a lot of the user admin side of things is very manual. Have you got views into federated access for people to use it so that you don't have to continually add new users into the system so that they can use their own VMs? Uh, so I know the Nectar Cloud has uses the Australian Access Federation to let everybody have a certain allocation, but then it's up to the individual users to ask Nectar for a bigger allocation if they want to run a proper service. And then once it's their machine, it's their machine. So. Uh, so a lot of what we've been talking about today is, is again the behind the scenes stuff. So it's not what you really need to do with everyday running of the system. Um, maybe users could talk about adding users to the cloud bridge though. Uh, access for the Australian Access Federation, there is one big issue with that. And that is if you have your AAF credential, you can't get your API keys to your up, uh, Nectar Cloud. And we have been in contact with them, and if they can solve that, yeah, that, that would be an easy issue. But since there is no solution for that, uh, we had to come up with something that does not, yeah, to solve the problem. Yeah. Are there any other questions? Okay then. Uh, okay. Thanks guys. Thank